continuing our series of being dangerous, living dangerously, the art of living dangerously, in a dying world. Friends, I, I don't know about you, but uh, this week, uh, I, I try to make it a point not to watch national news as much as possible because it, it just, just gets you down. And, and, uh, but folks, I couldn't stay away from, from what happened in, in Boston this week and then seeing the tragedy in, in Texas uh, and just, just following. How many of y'all have been following some of those stories? Well, that's just by everybody. Uh, if, ever, if ever there was, there was an illustration that we are living in a dying world, I think we've seen that. Uh, we've been reminded of that this week. Uh, you know, I was, I was sitting there, I was thinking about folks I knew that, had, that are here that have been in, in Boston, uh, but I was thinking about you uh, coming in from, from Boston, and folks that have, have uh, homes that have uh, been, been gone through, you know, there's these uh, terrorists, and it's just, uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, friends, that, that uh, we see this, this death and this destruction around us. And we wonder, God, is there any possibility? Is there any hope? Is, is the world really going to be that much worse? You know, this is, we, we're seeing now, friends, the first generations in American history that believe that the, the following generation, that parents are believing now for the first time that their children will have a, a worse outlook, will have a worse society that they'll grow up in than we have. Friends, what a tragedy that is. That the world that we're passing along, the world that, that I, am, I am giving to my children is going to be worse, it's going to be more volatile, it's going to be more deadly than the world that, that I grew up in. Uh, I, was, I was talking the other day about uh, just, just some of the, the changes in schools uh, the things that, that we face, I had someone ask me, well, did you ever, did you ever see, see violence in school? And did you ever see drugs? And did you ever? I said, yeah, I see some of those things. But they were so isolated. And now, friends, they're so prevalent that the situation becomes impossible. We start to look forward, and, and we don't want to look forward. We don't want to look into the future because the present is so terrible sometimes. It's so random. Daniel, if you'll remember, was kidnapped as a young man. He was kidnapped somewhere between the ages of 13 and 17 years old. He and his friends were, were taken from their families, taken uh, literally hundreds of miles away by a, a pagan king into captivity, never to be returned. There was no hope for them that, that they were going to be sent back. They were taken away from, from their faith, their, their training, their, their, their Christian, or we, what we would call a Christian family. Uh, their church family is gone. And they're being brought up forcibly in a, a pagan society. A society that has nothing to do with how they live. In fact, when they get there, Daniel and three others alone among this large group of captives, those four men alone continue to live for God. They're facing an impossible situation. But unfortunately for Daniel and his friends, the situation is about to get distinctly worse. At least they have their lives. But we're going to see in Daniel chapter 2 that they come into a situation not of their own making, not of their own choosing, that is absolutely impossible. It has to do with King Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to look in Daniel chapter 2, with me, either on the board, your iPhone, your pad, your, <laughs> heavens, your Bible, uh, whatever, whatever it means that you have, I want you to see the Scripture. Because friends, it doesn't really matter what I say, it matters what the Word of God says. Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep broke from him. Now, this can get a little confusing. Why is this the second year of his reign? Daniel was, remember, uh, captive in his first year. And then we have, have three years of training. We studied last week 
Is Daniel still in training? No, he's just graduated without getting into a, a study of the Babylonian calendar. Uh, let me just tell you that it has to do with the way the months fall. Their new year falls in Nisan, which is like our October-ish. Uh, and so this would be just after Daniel's graduation from his training program as one of the wise men. He and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have graduated. They've, they've passed their college course. They're about 20 years old now, uh, give or take, and they are one of the, the junior Chaldeans, one of the junior wise men, uh, advisors, counselors of uh, the Babylonian Empire. And remember, to be part of that group of Chaldeans, there is a religious aspect. They would have been taught uh, some of the, the uh, practices uh, of the pagan religions, certainly, of that day. Does that mean that they're participating? No, we see in Daniel chapter 1 that they have been excluded from participation because of God's hand and leading and protection. And so they have knowledge, but not participation. And they've shown that God's way is a better way. And so they have a unique place, a unique place of respect, but they also have all of this training that they have gone through. And Nebuchadnezzar, this young king, this highly successful king already, this great warrior has broken the Egyptian empire at the Battle of Carchemish in 605, has, has conquered uh, Palestine and most of the Fertile Crescent already, is now in his, his palace and he is dreaming dreams. How many of y'all had a, had a dream last night? Well, you have a dream. How, do you remember the dream? I tell you, you know the worst thing for me is when I have a really good dream and I can't remember what it was. Why is it that you only remember the bad ones or the really strange ones that are like, oh, I'm glad Freud isn't examining me on this dream. What could that possibly mean? I better not tell anybody because they're going to think I'm crazy. They will lock me up. Uh, but the really good dreams, the dreams that you wake up and, and you say, you know, oh, I wish that alarm hadn't gone off because I could have just enjoyed that dream. For, for a long time. Well, friends, this is kind of what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He's dreaming dreams, but he, he's dreaming in such a way that it's constantly waking him up. And he can't really remember clearly what the dream was. He has an impression, he has a feeling of the dream where he would recognize it if only he could, could, could put it together. It's like when, when I ask you, who's the actor that plays so-and-so? And you know who it is, but you can't quite get it out. This is how Nebuchadnezzar is functioning with this dream. He knows it's important. And it's keeping him up because he's trying to remember what the dream was. It's repetitive, and he knows it. And so what does he do? Well, here's what Nebuchadnezzar does. The king, in verse 2, commanded to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, four different groups of wise men. The magicians, these are, these are not uh, rabbit-out-of-your-hat type of magicians. If you look at this in, in the, uh, the original, this is actually from the root word that we would get uh, pen or stylus from. These, are, these would be men of learning. Uh, scholars would, would be a, a way to understand these magicians. Uh, there are certainly some rabbit-out-of-the-hat guys. These are called the sorcerers, that next group. Uh, the astrologers. Uh, there's some debate on who these guys are, if they're really into the Zodiac and, and doing all this business, or if they're just kind of into uh, Psychic Friends Network type of stuff. And probably it's kind of a combination of them, them all. Uh, they've got Dion Warwick on retainer here at the court of Babylon. And uh, so the Chaldeans, uh, and, and Daniel's one of the Chaldeans. So to show the king his dreams. And so they came and they stood before the king. King's called his counselors in, and he says to them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. I'm upset. I need to know about it. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac. By the way, this is where the Aramaic part of Daniel comes in, and we stay with Aramaic, Aramaic language all the way through Daniel chapter 7. Uh, why is that significant? Well, Bible scholar, it's significant because through chapter 7, we're talking about Gentile prophecy. If you're a Gentile, it means if you're something other than being a Jew this morning, uh, Daniel's chapter 2 through Daniel chapter 7 deal with our future. 
This is where we start getting very prophetic. Uh, not this morning. If you're into prophecy, you'll have to hold off a couple weeks uh, until we get into this dream more, more significantly. But uh, this, this change in language means that Daniel is writing to a Gentile audience because the Gentiles, us, those that are around him, are most keenly in need of this information. That's why this part of Daniel is recorded in the, the Syriac or in the Aramaic. Uh, o king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Now, how many folks in here can interpret a dream if it's told to you? But Everybody can raise your hand. You can do it. You know there's two types of dream interpretation. There's the right one and the wrong one. See, you didn't know you had the spiritual gift of dream interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. I don't remember it. If you will not make known to me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, you will be cut to pieces and your houses made into a pile of horse poo. Dunghill is the... That's the translation. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you will receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Three things when you face the impossible. When you discover your ship has come in, but it was filled with horse poo, you realize that you're in an impossible situation. You know, I was watching, I I sometimes will watch this show The lottery changed my life. Any of y'all ever seen that show? You know, that's the the ship has come in. Finally, uh, I won the Powerball jackpot of $52 million. And and, uh, after taxes, that works out to about about $2 million. And uh, with that $2 million, after I paid back all my relatives, I had $84 to go get dinner. My ship came in. You know, it's an interesting thing when you look at people who have won the lottery, and they've done some interesting studies that are not on that show about people who have won significant amounts of money through the lottery. And they've asked them uh, several years after their win, are you happier now than you were before you won? The numbers are overwhelming that people are miserable after they have won the lottery. Oh, I wouldn't be. Pastor... If I won the lottery, by the way, the lottery is a huge waste of money. You know, you want to win the lottery? Tithe to God. (coughs) Amen? My word, who can give you more? The lottery, the Powerball, or God? Who's got more resources? Amen. Give to the one that can actually give back to you. The odds are much better. Friends, when they put the money in, they get that money out of... The big paycheck comes. They go out and and they they begin to get all the things that they thought would make them happy. Their ship finally has come in. And you know, it's an amazing thing. The extremely high rate of divorce. Families, would you rather have your husband or your wife and have that relationship or would you rather have $5 million? Don't answer that, some of y'all. Would you rather have your children living for God or have all that wealth that when it was poured into them, they couldn't handle it and they went off the deep end? You see, friends, sometimes we're looking for our ship to come in. And we're in this impossible situation. And if I could only win the lottery... If I could only have this amazing circumstance come into my life, if, I could, if my number would just come up this one time, if my ship would just come in, it'd all be fine. All the impossible could be possible. Friends, these astrologers, these Chaldeans, Daniel's one of them, this whole group of wise men, their ship is about to come in. If they can successfully tell the king the answer to this question, they're going to get everything that they have worked for their whole life. The problem is, 
that if they don't tell him right, they're going to get cut to pieces. And their homes are going to be turned into the king's stable droppings. That ship came in, but it's filled with poo. Sometimes we feel that, and we find that in our lives, don't we? I got everything that I wanted, and I didn't want any of it. Wow. So here they are with an impossible situation. Your ship can come in, but you have to tell the king what his dream was, and even he doesn't really remember it. He's just hoping it'll ring a bell when you say it back to him. And if you don't happen to ring that bell, you and everybody else is dead. Discovering that your ship came in but was filled with death. Here is, here is number uh, two. Look at verse seven with me. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation thereof. See, they're trying to change the king's mind. They're trying to change the circumstance. Let's, let's change this, king. We can make this work. The offer is good. Let's just make a couple modifications. And the king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain time because you see that the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is only one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. You see, the king had a double motive here. These Chaldeans, these advisors, were Nebuchadnezzar's, his dad's advisors. Most of these guys did not come up under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar are very different people. Nebuchadnezzar historically didn't like his dad or his advisors at all. Had no respect for them. And so he had an opportunity here to catch them in the lie, to show them to be be uh, false, as he believed them to be, to expose them, and to run them under. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing. He says, look, if they can come up with my dream, so much the better for me. But if they can't, like I know they can't, then I have an excuse to kill them all and replace them with new people. I don't need advisors. I'm the king. The Chaldeans answered. Interesting, it's always the Chaldeans. You know what? Clearly who the leader is here. The smart guys, the Chaldeans, answered before the king and said, there's not a man on the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, no king, no lord, no ruler that asks such a thing at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. That's a rare thing that the king requires. In other words, nobody ever asked this king. You're out of line. There's none that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not in flesh. See, they're saying well, this, is a, this is a God thing. They don't believe in God. This is this. They're talking about Baal. The king, you have a better way to talk to the gods than we do. Go in and see if this is more than we can answer. The king's angry about that. Verse 12, For this cause, the king was angry, very furious, and he commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. when you're facing an impossible situation, guys, what's our reaction? Do more or do less, isn't it? When I'm up against uh, some, some odds that are insurmountable, a situation that I feel like I cannot overcome that's, that's impossible, my reaction is to do everything I possibly can. To get into it 100%, to take it on head on, grab the bull by the horns and go at it. Y'all ever go that way? Nothing's impossible if I work hard enough. Amen, guys? Nothing's impossible if I put myself into it enough. This is why we have workaholics. Because we see this, this obstacle. I want to get to this place in my life, and it's impossible unless I do this and this and this and this and I sacrifice all of this, and I do everything that I need to do, and then it'll come. Isn't that the American dream, by the way? The American dream is, if I work hard enough, all things are possible, right? We've been brought up on this. This is our culture as Americans. You can do enough. 
to be successful. You can overcome any obstacle, any odds, because of, of our own initiative. Friends, sometimes God has to stop us so that He can start. This has to get out of the hands of what Daniel can do for God to get the glory. Daniel and his friends, friends, they're not anything different than any other person living for Christ. They're four guys who have made the decision to follow God. They're not any different than any person in this room can be. They're faced with an impossible situation. Not of their making. They didn't give Nebuchadnezzar the dream. They didn't have this personal grudge with Nebuchadnezzar. Friends, when this grudge occurred, they were back in uh, Israel. They had nothing to do with any of this. But now they've found that they had to be stopped so that God can start. See, where we finally reach a point where we say we cannot do it. I can't do it. Where we take ourselves out of the equation. That doesn't mean we throw up our arms and give up. It doesn't mean that we have an excuse to be lazy. It means that we realize the futility of our own effort. And that everything does belong to God. We put it into God's hands. And we find verse 13. I'm going to close with this. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to kill them. That's good news. Why would that be good news? Do you notice in verse 13, there's, only, there's an occurrence that only happens in verse 13 of this story. Daniel's name is mentioned. And they actually go looking for Daniel. You see, Daniel's the junior wise man. He's too young to have the answer. He's too inexperienced. So he and his friends are left back at the wise man school. And all the seasoned wise men come out. And they meet with the king. And they don't have an answer. In fact, they realize they don't have an answer, so they're not even going to take a shot. The king gets angry. He says, I'm going to kill every one of you. Maybe he kills a lot of them. I don't know. History doesn't tell us. More likely, this is a planned public execution of all of his wise men for being false. And so they go looking for Daniel. Friends, Daniel in this moment learned a very important lesson. It's a lesson that we need to be aware of in our lives, especially when we are facing an impossible dangerous or deadly situation. The lesson is this, that sometimes God has prepared you so that He can spare you. Take this in. What in the world is God doing in your life? Sometimes we go through things, don't we, that that, that just floor us. God, I can't take any more of this. God, there... The opposition, there's too much of it. God, the, 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 the mountain is too high. The debt is too large. The hurt is too great. The loss is too deep. But God knows you. And He knows me. And He knows our steps. And He knows our future. And these things that He allows to happen in your life and in my life, painful and hard as they are. That mountain that seems absolutely impossible is so often preparation. It's preparation for our preservation. Because He knows what's coming next. And He knows that when He prepares us to go over that mountain, that there's another mountain on the other side that eclipses what we're facing now. And He's preparing us on this hill to spare us through the next hill. You see, friends, if Daniel 
did not get taken into captivity, he probably would have been executed in, ne in Nebuchadnezzar's next round of conquests. God brings Daniel into Babylon and spares him. God keeps Daniel with the Chaldeans say, <coughs> well, this is a nightmare. What a, what a horrible thing as a parent to see your, your child taken from you. <coughs> Sorry, I've been fighting that cough. Anybody fighting that cough this week? Man, oh man, stay away from me. Sorry. Uh, oh, it's been Friends, God sees Daniel taken away from his family. He's brought up being taught all kinds of false things. He's exposed to false religion, to pagan beliefs. He's in a worse situation possible. By the way, very similar to what college is in the world today. Amen? Friends, you know that, that about 2% of college professors are born-again Christians in the United States? About 2%. They're being brought up, our kids are being brought up in a foreign belief system. I, I wondered why God allowed me, you know, God, why would you call me to ministry <coughs> and have me spend three years studying in a secular school? Well, so he could teach me things there that weren't being taught in Bible college. He prepared me for, for other things, for another perspective. Why would we, we take joy when our, our kids are brought up in a harsh environment like this? Friends, Daniel is in this harsh environment. But it hardens him. It prepares him. And that environment, that training, the way that he faces the impossible is going to be exactly what God uses to spare him. And to spare his life, his friends' lives and the lives of many of these wise men. Friends, if you're facing an impossible situation today, I want you to know that there's hope. That there's help. You're not alone. You're not alone. That if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He goes with you. He is not causing hurt in your life. But he may be allowing some things to happen to save your life. <coughs> and he will not give up on you. Friends, I don't want to be cliche. I want to be very heart to heart with you today. God will never put more on you than he puts in you. You've heard that, amen? I found that true in my life. And sometimes I say, God, you better put some more in because I'm, I'm just empty. It'll put just enough in to keep going. Friends, keep trusting. Keep believing. And friend, if you're here this morning and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you're trying to climb this mountain alone, you're trying to face this impossible situation by yourself, Friend, I want to tell you that your situation is absolutely hopeless and you should despair for your life. I want you to hear that your situation is as, ne as negative as you have ever believed it to be and worse. Because, friend, you are alone. You're correct. But you don't have to be. That's the great news. That's what the cross is all about, friends. It's about not being alone. It's about not dying. It's about living. It's about having hope. But that's why we look at a cross and we don't feel sorrow as much as we feel joy as Christians. We sorrow that the Lord died, but we have so much greater joy that He died for us. He died for hope. He died for our lives. He died so that we do not have to live in despair. Friend, you do not have to live alone. You do not have to live in despair today. Because of my Savior who gave His life for you.
Ben, we're going to have a, a time of invitation. We do this every week. If you're one of our guests, I want you to know this is, this is something that we, we always do. I believe every service should have an opportunity for us to be able to pray together and to make a decision for how God has moved in our lives today. Friend, if, if you're here and you're trying to do life alone, you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I promise you I will not embarrass you. But I do want to talk to you. I want to pray for you. I want to show you from my Bible how you can know today that if you died today, if your eternity began now, that heaven would be your home. That you can have hope. That you don't, do not have to despair any longer. Friend, if I can pray with you or for you, I'd be honored to about anything. That's one of the privileges of being your pastor. It's getting to pray for you. And I do. I have a stack this high on my desk of prayer requests that I pray for constantly for you. Friends, I love you. But more than that, God loves you more than anybody ever could or could explain to you. Don't despair. All things are possible with God. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning as the team sings. Sing with them. Friends, I will be at the cross. If I can pray with you or pray for you, why don't you meet me at the cross this morning?